Well, thanks for being here. I'm here with Rolf Potts, uh, George Fox College graduate, uh, world traveler, New York Times bestselling author, wrote a book called Vagabonding, An Uncommon Guide to the Art of Long-Term Travel. Did I get that right? Long-Term World Travel. Long-Term but, World Travel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get started right away with a question. You offer this advice to young people, students. You talk about wasting your 20s. What do you right. mean by wasting your 20s? Right. That's a fun one to lead with. Um, I say waste your 20s because I think people in their 20s, especially just when they finish college, are really nervous about getting started in the professional world and feel like that they could sort of ruin their future if they don't lock into some professional track very early. And so I've taught at various colleges and I've spoken at very college, various colleges and there's this cliche that, oh, young people just want to go and have fun. And that's, it's sort of the opposite. I've talked to retirees and mid-career people who are just like, I want to travel the world and enjoy myself. Whereas, um, you know, students tend to be nervous. You know, they, if they travel, they want to have a very serious mission to go on. Um, but my advice, waste your 20s, doesn't mean that you should just do something foolish for your 20s. <laughs> it's actually an opportunity to try something and risk failure in a way that won't have the same ripples as if, if you're older and you have a family and you're more established in life. There's really no better chance in life than during that decade to try bold things and try new things and, and go to some strange part of the world and try some new talent. Um, and as I tell people, oftentimes the skills that you learn almost by accident from travel or however you decide to constructively waste your 20s actually makes you not only a fuller person, but a more employable person. Um, and so, I mean, I've, I've spoken in Ivy League colleges before where, where people are really locked in on their career. I mean, they've been studying since they were eight years old to go to this Ivy League college. And now they want to really, really grab the, the, the world by the horns after graduation. And I say, look, you know, you're never going to be able to have this chunk of time, regardless of all your qualifications and your elite education. So go take that great education and have adventures that you don't know what's going to happen yet. Yeah. And there's a fear of failure. Often I, I tell my students too, that uh, what's the worst that could happen? What's the absolute worst that could happen? You get to a country and then something happens and you come back home and there you had two weeks in a foreign country, a month, maybe two months, but really like the worst case scenarios are not that bad, except for the sort of the sense of, oh, I failed. I guess I didn't make it happen in this country. I speak to travel writers about that a lot too. And one great thing about being a failed travel writer is at least you traveled, right? <laughs> if you traveled the world for two years, wrote a book about it and nobody's interested in publishing it, well then, gosh, you had a more interesting couple of years than, than other people have. And so, and actually um, my first post-college experience was living in a van and traveling around America and having this really exciting vagabonding experience. I tried to write a book about it and failed that first book, but I learned so much from that failure that basically if you would have talked to me when I was 25, 26 years old, I would have been so disappointed by life when in fact that was the real post-college education was trying to do something, failing, understanding why it failed and trying again. Um, I think I was 30 when Vagabonding came out. So those failures at, that happened when I was 24, 25, 26 were kind of my grad school for the success that came later. Nice. Let's talk about adventure. What okay. does adventure mean to you? How do you how do you come up with these trips, these stories? Do you have an, a list of things you want to do? I, I want to you know these adventures in these foreign countries, or do you just arrive to the country and say, "What's here? Let's let's make something happen." A little bit of both, um, because I think sometimes you can prepare all you want for a country, but once you get there, after a couple of days, you're already smarter than you were in your office studying through your screen, right? And you're talking to travelers who are leaving the country and have been there for a long time. You're talking to local people and suddenly you have a ton more ideas than you did when, when you first came. And so as a travel writer, often it's a mix that I have some ideas of things I might do, but then when I get there, I often finds out, find out that I had no idea how awesome and interesting and curious this place was. Um, I think adventure is also, there's a quote, somebody said that um, like these days we pay people to take us on adventures that former generations of travelers would pay to avoid, right? <laughs> so you, you, you know, you, you climb cliffs and, and kayak rivers and stuff. So there's actually an adventure travel industry now um, that basically enables you to safely climb that mountain or safely go down that whitewater, which is great. I'm a, I'm a fan of, of the adventure travel industry, but my philosophy is that an adventure is really pushing your comfort zone in any way. Uh, and in a sense, yeah, you could, 
you could be on that high dollar hike through the Himalayas, but it's just as much of an adventure to take a day off from that hike and go talk to people in a village where you don't really share the language, but you're trying to figure it out and you're sort of reaching out across cultural lines. And so really, I think I really encourage people to try those subtle adventures, like get on a local bus and travel like Ugandans do for a day. And you'll learn so much more about Ugandan being crammed in a little the minibus with a bunch of friendly people wondering why an American is, is taking the cheapest form of transportation that yields adventures that are really super memorable. And again, I don't want to knock rappelling off a cliff or, <laughs> you know, whatever adventure travel industry would have you think it is, but really there, it's just so easy to have adventures where you're really trying something you wouldn't have tried at home and you're learning so much about the place you are. Yeah. And there's a spontaneous nature that I enjoy about travel. Let's get to a country and don't, plan it so well and so tightly that there's no room for some kind of spontaneous sort of side adventure. I remember in Vietnam, we were traveling up the coast and we got kind of tired of the sort of tourist trail. And we ended up talking to somebody who asked us, hey, do you want to ride motorcycles on the Ho Chi Minh Trail? You know, we're like, yes, yes, we would. And so we ended up four days uh, kind of off the beaten, t- off, the, off the beaten path mm-hmm. on motorcycles. And so how do you, I, I guess, you know, to maybe newer travelers, is there a good balance between prepping a trip and leaving some space for spontaneity and for, you know, uh, maybe you meet somebody and they give you some suggestions, but your trip is so packed that you don't have room for that. Right. Well, in Vagabonding, I say, know your options, but not your destiny, right? (laughs) So research that trip, but be willing to throw away any of your plans if you find something better. And this is one thing, it's so easy now to literally find a place to stay and eat every day of your trip on the other side of the world. Well, you get locked into that kind of thing and pretty soon you've met the most interesting person you've ever met. You know, you're you're traveling around in Myanmar and you're talking to this person from Germany and hanging out with somebody from Alabama and suddenly it's like, wow, these people are cool. Why did I reserve that expensive hotel the next stop up? So I think if it's your first trip, um, maybe don't worry about that too much. Maybe make some plans, just sort of get a taste for what travel is like. But The more you travel, I think the less you need to plan because you know that there's just so many amazing things awaiting you. And and really even, unless you're going to a place during tourist high season or during a festival, there's really no need to plan your hotel months in advance. And I'm a big fan of dirt bag hotels. You know, why why pay $200 and have great thread count sheets when you could pay $8 and put up with somebody else's foot smell and have a great time? (laughs) Nice, yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. I I, I traveled around Europe and... We didn't stay in too many hotels. We ended up sleeping on, under bridges and in bushes. And, and in some ways that was very freeing. It was, there was a sense of waking up and not really sure what was gonna happen. A lot of the major tourist attractions, I'm not gonna say they were disappointing, but I mean, you're gonna go see the Eiffel Tower and it's beautiful and it's nice, get a picture. But the stories are gonna be the people that you meet or the sort of, yeah, off the beaten path. Um, talk to us about the, some of the people that you've met. You, you mentioned this often in your talks, like it's make it about the people that you meet. How do you go about meeting people on your trips? Well, often I, I meet people by traveling alone um, because you're you're more approachable when you're alone um, because even with one other person, you're sort of a self-contained bubble and people think, oh, this guy's fine. Whereas if you're the obviously not from a place and you're wandering around and looking at things or looking a little lost, somebody will say, oh, that guy is not from here. Let's go see what he wants. Um, and, and really, um, if you read my second book, Marco Polo didn't go there. It's, it's obvious that I have a penchant for meeting the town weirdo, like <laughs> the, the eccentric guy whose family has stopped talking to him wants to talk to me. Um, and it's fun. You can learn so much just by randomly engaging with people. And I think sometimes, you know, you mentioned tourist attractions versus sleeping under the bridge. Were you in your twenties when that happened? I was, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> didn't happen last week. Nope. Yeah. Um, I think you, um, you get away from from what you're supposed to do. Basically, there's there's reasons why tourist attractions are attractions. There's sort of a tautology there. They're attractions because they attract people, right? And they're great, but the local people don't hang out there. Right. Um, the local people, but they they go to sporting events and plays and they eat restaurants and the market. I've had some interesting experiences in like the Thai version of 7-Eleven, which actually in Thailand it is the 7-Eleven, they have 7-Elevens there. But like convenience marks, basically any time where you can mix with local people in their, in their routine, which is rarely waiting in line at the Louvre, right? Um, then you just have a chance to 
um, to interact with people. And, and actually people have an instinct to, they like to help people. So if you just ask somebody where to eat or how, where this bus goes or whatever, um, then people will take an interest. People are usually proud of their home and their homeland. Um, and it's fun. It's, it's, it seems daunting when you think about it. Uh, but when you go to a place, it's just a matter of being curious and open again, not so micromanaged in your planning that it's like, well, I would talk to you, buddy, but I have to go to this next tourist attraction in 30 minutes. If you're open to just whatever happens next to not really knowing what happens next, then that's, those are the best, most serendipitous moments of travel. Yeah. And you talk about joining soccer games that, that resonates with me as a former soccer player. Some of my best memories are, I remember on the beach in Brazil, ran in this middle of nowhere, town, not a tourist attraction at all, but ended up as a part of a soccer game on the beach. And it's one of my, my favorite memories. How do you get in, into that? That you just kind of stand on the sideline and kind of say, can I join? Or you just kind of hop in and start kicking the ball around? Yeah. You know, find, basically find sort of the charismatic leader type person. When you're telling that story, I thought of a time in, in Cambodia, um, there's like a village volleyball game going on and I was taller than everybody by at least, at least a head. And so I just stood there until they invited me in because they thought I would be a ringer, right? <laughs> and I am not uncoordinated, but they just destroyed me. I was the worst. I was the worst ringer in the world. So basically, just because I was tall and standing there, they included me in the volleyball game. But after about like eight serves, I was back out. They, they wanted to win. Um, yeah, just standing and looking, especially in a place if you're in a part of the world like I'm, sort of European looking. So if I stood around at the edge of a game in Norway, they might think I was. I don't know. Americans usually advertise themselves somehow yeah. through their white socks or being too loud <laughs> or whatever. Um, but any other part of the world where it's obvious I'm not from there, if I watch long enough, um, they might invite me in. Or if there's a break in the game, I can talk to somebody, ask a question, who's winning, you know. Uh, and unless, again, unless they're super competitive and this is some tournament game, usually they're open to including you, especially if it's kids. That's another thing too, is that a great thing about kids is they don't care if you speak perfect you know, whatever language they speak, they just want somebody who has fun and has a good time and makes their day more interesting. And so kids are so unselfconscious about that. So especially when they're playing games or, and kids are always playing games uh, in parts of the world where they're not trapped behind their iPad screens, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just different ways to engage. And sometimes it's a low stakes thing. It might, might not last very long. Other times, suddenly you, you've been in the village for three days and been to a wedding and learned how to cook the local food. It is... It's really fun, especially in parts of the world that are less industrialized. People just have more time for you. Yeah. Um, I think you can learn a lot from people who don't micromanage their days. And it's like, I, I've met people like fathers who spend a ton of time with their kids. You know, they don't plan special, you know, soccer practice times. They're just, their kids are always around. And, and so I think we can idealize things about the way we live. And of course, traveling helps you appreciate a place like America. But then you also realize that there's certain ways of living that are kind of really enjoyable. Yeah. And hospitality is, is big as well. I remember in Ethiopia, my wife and I, where I proposed to my wife and we ended up uh, meeting a, uh, a tour guide and she, we told her, yeah, we just, I just proposed. She said yes. And she got super excited, ended up inviting us to her house. And we had kind of our sort of engagement dinner at her house with her parents. And they brought out all kinds of, you know, it was, it was a good meal. It was, but it was super fun just to be uh, included and to, and to see that part of the culture in such a, such a personal, unique way. And it just happened just, you know, by telling a story, just by connecting with, with this tour guide, it was, it was incredible. But that gets me to a question about communication. A lot of people talk about traveling and they're kind of afraid. I don't speak the language. Uh, how am I going to get around? How can I, how can I, I don't know how to ask where the bathroom is, for instance. Has that, are you worried about that, afraid about that? Sometimes a little bit. And um, one advantage we have as 21st century Americans is that English is the lingua franca around the world. And even if your average 50 year old doesn't speak it, your average 15 year old is gonna be studying it. Right. Um, I remember once uh, when I was in Myanmar, I asked, there was some festival going on. I asked the proprietor of a business what was happening and he couldn't answer me, but he got his grandson. <laughs> And the, I talked to the grandson, the grandson took me to school. I talked to his English class and, and pretty soon I was invited to the festival that I just asked a question about. Um, and that was all in English. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't speak much Burmese, but also you're talking about like, where's the bathroom? You know, you can learn that phrase pretty easily on a boring bus ride from point A to point B. Yeah. You can learn numbers, you can learn where is dot, dot, dot. And that really goes a lot 
a, a long way in terms of goodwill is that if someone sees you trying to learn their language, they'll think, oh, that guy, he just said hello in the cutest way. He said hello like eight-year-olds say hello. Let's go, let's try and help him out. And then oftentimes they will fetch the kid or the, the old sailor who knows some English. And then your day is suddenly a lot more interesting. And so I think that sort of constraint can be fun sometimes because it's almost like a mystery to be solved. And then suddenly your host people are trying to help you and you're trying to communicate what you need, how you need to be helped. So it can be fun. I'm curious actually about your Ethiopian dinner. Did, did they, did you, they have the ritual in Ethiopia where they, they put food in your mouth? No, okay. no, that, that, it wasn't quite that. It, um, it was just a, a meal and fam. That happened to me in, in South Korea though. Okay. I, I didn't know I was, I'd been there for two days, didn't, didn't know what to order. I was in the kind of not a touristy part of the town in Seoul. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was lost in this restaurant and this lady kind of kind of took me under her wing, I guess, and sat me down and ordered something and the food came. And then she, it was the, the lettuce wrap where you kind of put different types of food. I think there's a meat that goes in there. It was, mm -hmm. it was delicious, but she ended up wrapping it and then put the food in my mouth with her <laughs> fingers. And I thought she was handing it to me and I went to grab it and she was like, no, 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 no. And then she like kind of put it in my mouth. And so for the next hour, I sat there with this, this woman who she didn't speak English. I didn't speak Korean, but it was just, it was a interesting experience. But no, that wasn't Ethiopian. Well, food is such a great window yeah. into any culture because everybody has to eat. Most people love eating. Everybody has their own spin on cuisine. And so what a fantastic um, way to meet people and get to know a place better. Yeah, which gets me to, to another point you make often, which is uh, in different parts of the country, they eat, they eat different types of meat. Um, so we could talk about eating dog, which right. to the United States, to Americans can seem kind of jarring. What are you doing eating dog? That's a pet. Right. What, what has been your experience in that, in that regard? Well, that was specific, uh, to Korea and, and, uh, because there's a, there's a dish there called Boshintong, which literally means health enhancement stew, but it's, it's, um, it's a dog meat stew that is usually eaten by middle-aged men. Or at least they did when we ate there. And it's, it's funny to talk about sometimes because when I bring up, um, dog meat consumption in that part of Asia, people think, oh, he's saying bad things about Asian. And it's like, well, no, uh, actually that some people do it, not everybody does it. But the lesson I always teach is that we see, I mean, for generations around the world, any nearby meat was consumed by meat eaters, but dogs were domesticated and are sort of anthropomorphic. And so we think it's weird to eat them. And so I told my students that, you know, they would, they would say, oh yeah, my uncle eats dog meat once a week. It's, he thinks it's good for his health. And I said, but that's, that would be considered inhumane in America. And my students again and again would say, well, okay, yeah, I see that. But we think it's inhumane when you ship grandma off to the care home across town, because when our old people get old, we move them inside and we take care of them and we love them. And so, <laughs> That was a great, again, a food-based pretext for me to realize that, yeah, actually our cultural practice, in, in some ways we treat our dogs better than our grandma, yeah. you know, that, that basically we'll, we'll give our dog a name and a special place to sit and, and we love our dog, but then grandma, we, we visit her twice a month. We're a good, grand, we're a good grandson, right? <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of ways that we can find culture as a starting point. Korea is another place where I realized that individualism, which is such an American principle, is not seen as a virtue in Korea. It's sort of seen as seen, putting yourself before your family and community. And I wouldn't have learned that had I not lived in Korea for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to look for the, uh, I guess, strange for me. I remember in, in Cambodia, we were sitting somewhere by a river and somebody came by and said, hey, do you want to eat spider? You know, and right away, like, yeah, sure, let's go. So we ate like a fried spider. It cost you pay one dollar and you get kind of four the spiders. There were a few cockroaches, I think, as well. And probably not supposed to talk about this now, given the pandemic and where that might have come from. But oh. it, it was it was a part of the, you know, when, when you when you go to a foreign country, what are you going to do? Are you going to eat pasta? Are you going to look for the McDonald's? Or are you going to try to figure out what is, it, what is it that they eat? And a lot of it, too, comes down to the story you want to tell, too, right? I mean, as a writer, you're looking for these experiences. Sure. You're going to write about them. And I agree that food is, is it's a great way to enter into the culture. Yeah. Well, Korea, I, I remember I went to like an amusement park and they had popcorn and cotton candy, but they also had bundegi, which is fried silkworm larva. <laughs> so it's, it's literally these little, these fried stewed bugs. And it's actually pretty good. When I was in Thailand, I ate fried grasshopper and, yeah. and cricket and um, yeah. And so the definition of food, what is culturally considered, well, actually 
I, you have Cuban ancestry, so you'll appreciate this. Um, when I met my Cuban bagpiper friends in, in Canada, it was the first time they'd been out of Cuba. And, I, and when I was in Cuba with them, the food wasn't that great. And so I was giving them various food and I bought them a bag of Doritos and I gave them a Dorito and my friend started eating it. And then he started scraping his tongue off. Like it was just, he's like, is this really food? How do you consider this food? And I looked at the label and I'm sorry if Dorito sponsors this, uh, this podcast, but, um, there's just some weird stuff in American <laughs> fast food that we've forgotten about how weird it is to eat yellow number five and malodextrin or whatever. Um, and so you get some funny perspectives on what is normal and, and we could riff on food all day, but like when I go to France, one great thing, food is tastes so good in France, but you're eating those cherries in early July and those were on a tree 50 miles away the week before, right? Mm -hmm. We're just used to eating food that's been transported thousands of miles in the United States for our convenience that we've forgotten the pleasure of seasonal food, yeah. the, the pleasure. Yeah. Do you recommend people to try these strange things, strange strange for us? In Spain, we eat snails, for instance, and I mm -hmm. always encourage my students, I always end up buying a, a pod and, hey, you all, you have to eat one snail, you know, and it's kind of strange for them. They're using a toothpick and slurping it out, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's some of the, that's the most fun. I mean, when I first went to Korea, I thought kimchi was weird, yeah. you know, the, the, the pickled cabbage. And now it's sort of my comfort food. I really enjoy Korean food. And one thing I talk about in my new book that's coming out this fall is that when Alexander the Great's armies, they were marching through India, they found, they discovered this pod, they said that was a foot long and um, the bean was as sweet as honey. It was a banana, right? You know, they didn't, they didn't, Europe didn't have bananas in Alexander the Great's day. And so the fact that these soldiers were daring enough to try new food meant that suddenly Europeans knew what the banana was. Yeah. And so again, I think what is normal for some cultures, a, a Dorito, again, not to pick on Dorito too much, it's packaged to per, be preserved for a year and yeah. taste the same way uh, 99, 999 times out of a thousand. Whereas those more localized food habits um, are really a fun part of the process. And I think you can accidentally, I, I often sort of had this self-satisfied American attitude that I brought into various parts of the rest of the world. And I realized how humbling it was that a lot of the way people eat, for example, or live in their houses or relate to their neighbors makes a lot more sense than the way do, we do stateside. You mentioned in passing earlier, the bagpipes in Cuba. Mm. You went to Cuba to learn how to play the bagpipes? Well, I didn't go to Cuba to learn how to bag, play the bagpipes. This is funny. Um, I went there to learn salsa. I, I thought at a certain part of my career, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm a sporty guy. I've climbed mountains, you know, it, it, the hardest thing I can think of to do would be to learn how to dance in Latin America. You know, that's more complicated than climbing a mountain. So I studied merengue in the Dominican Republic, and then I went to Cuba to learn salsa, and I learned it a little bit, but I, a, somebody set me up with her friend in Cuba, and they they were just hobbyist bagpipers who played at the Asturian Federation, which in Asturias is a Celtic part of Spain. It's it's not an anomaly in, in Cuba that literally Asturian people from a Celtic's part of Spain settled there in the 19th century. And then suddenly in this place, I realized after half a month in, in Havana that I was sort of dreading my salsa lessons and looking forward to hanging out with my bagpiper friends. And so I could I could play, maybe to this day, I could play Don't Get Married in Oviedo um, <laughs> on the bagpipes. <laughs> and my, my, um, my salsa dancing was not that good. Uh, and so you just learn these nuances that of course, everybody goes to Cuba to, you know, see old cars or do the, the normal drink. What is it? Mojitos or something. Yeah. But then suddenly smoke I was- cigars, you know. Smoke, yeah, cigars yeah. is a perfect example. Yeah. Um, and you walk down the street and Cubans come up and want to sell you cigars. But suddenly I was hanging out with these awesome young Cuban people who were playing, who were doing something very Cuban, which was playing the the, the Spanish bagpipes that had been on the island for, for 100 years. And it's one of my fondest memories uh, from- <laughs> almost anywhere in the world. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's fascinating to hear how you just end up in these situations. One of my favorite stories that you tell is uh, buying a boat to mm. go down the Mekong river. How, did, how does that come about? Yeah, no, that, that is something I'll never have an adventure like that because I would never do that again. <laughs> like basically the, the Mekong is, I think the world's 12th longest river, but it has the second largest volume of water behind the Amazon. So it's a, there's just a lot of water pumping through that and a false move can get you in trouble. But at the time, the Lonely Planet guidebook mentioned that it was possible to bargain for boats. And I was traveling with a guy from Alaska and another guy from California and, and they were pretty salty. One, of, one guy was a fisherman and so they knew their way around boats and they had bought a boat um, and somehow I managed to 
get invited onto that trip. And actually, by by the time we were we started up north in in Laos, in the country of Laos, by the time we were close to the Cambodian border, those guys had left; their visas had expired. And so, I, like, I was the skipper of this boat that I didn't know how to drive two weeks earlier. Uh, and it was just this amazing trip that we were under our own power. We literally owned this um, ten horsepower boat. We, we asked when when we asked the Laotians who sold, who sold us the boat, "What's the name of this boat?" They said, "Mixip." Mix and it's like, oh, this is the mix up. So we painted mix up on the side of the boat. <laughs> it turns out that means 10 horses. It was a 10 horsepower engine. They, we, they weren't asking, they, they thought we were asking how big the engine was, not the name of the ship. <laughs> I'm not sure if they named the river boats in Laos. Anyway, it was, it was a mind blowingly spectacular trip. Um, I wrote about it. Actually, I'm not sure if that's in my second book, Marco Polo. It's, it's online someplace, but we would just, we would sleep either in the boat or on the shores of the river overnight. We had no idea what would happen the next day. At a certain point, um, Mekong is the border between Thailand and Laos. And so there's a little bit of made some soldiers nervous in that part of the world. Um, it was just, it, it was an amazing trip uh, that I can hardly describe, but again, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. And I was just young enough to, uh, to be that bold as to be a riverboat captain for 900 miles That's in three awesome. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the mentality we've, you've said this a number of times is, uh, let's try this and see what happens. That, mm. that see what happens is what gets a little people, uh, some people nervous. Uh, you know, we, we want to be in control. We want to know what's going to happen, but there's a beauty to that spontaneity and that see what happens can turn into some amazing adventures. Like when you walked around, across Israel, but then I want to, I want to ask you about the time in the desert when you went to see, let's see what happens. And then something happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, one catchphrase I have in Vagabond is walk until your day becomes interesting. Yep. I think that that it, now as much as ever, we're not afraid. We want to know what's where we're going, what happens next. We want to plot our GPS route on our phone. When in fact, walking until your day be in, becomes interesting means you're just leaving it up to the, the fate of the universe to see what happens. And on the particular story you bring up is uh, I was walking... Well, it, there's a big backstory there. I wanted to buy a donkey. Like I, I, this was after I bought the boat in Laos. So I just wanted to go places and buy weird transportation and take them <laughs> places. And basically nobody wanted to sell me a donkey in Egypt. And there, and um, so this guy I was talking to, it became the name of my story. He says, be your own donkey, you just go walk. And so, yeah, so I walked off into the desert. Um, and it was really amazing because this was basically the Sahara, the Great Sand Sea, the Libyan desert, although technically it was in Egypt. And just walking through this wilderness of sand dunes was just viscerally and aesthetically amazing. Um, and I decided to sleep out. Actually, the cover of Vagabonding is from that trip. This me walking in the dunes. I s slept in the sand. Um, and then through a dumb set of circumstances, I sat on my bag, which had my spare water in it, and it burst the water. And suddenly I had wet clothes and no drinking water. And I had to hike out of the desert in the middle of the night. Basically, I had to... I had to triangulate, don't do this at home kids, but I had to try <laughs> triangulate where I was in relation to a road so I could hitch back because I didn't want to walk, you know, a day and a half, two days back uh, the way I came through a literal desert with no water, right? So I walked through the night when it was cooler to a road and, and hitched my way back to the, to the little oasis town where I started. Um, again, those misadventures make for great stories. And um, that was walking uh, oriented, but again, Protect your water bottles, people. That's especially <laughs> in the desert. That's serious business. So I can imagine some people listening might think that's too adventurous or, you know, I want to have these experiences. How do I get started? How does how does one get started? You just hop on a plane and go somewhere? Yeah. How, I, how did you get started? Um, well, actually, I started um, with a George Fox friend after I graduated. I worked as a landscaper for, for a while, saved money up in Seattle kitted out a van. Now it's called hashtag van life. Back then we were just, we just fixed up a van. And, um, at the time I thought I was going to scratch my travel itch and then be a proper work American workaholic for the rest of my life. But we lived in the van and traveled around and had this amazing America trip. And I realized that travel is a lot easier, safer, and simpler than you, you would think it would be. That said, I don't think there's any silver bullet for sort of figuring out how to travel. I think, you know, we talked here on campus to juniors abroad students, oftentimes maybe going on a, a three week juniors abroad trip, even if you've never been on a plane before, then suddenly it's like, okay, actually I'm in a 20 person group, but I don't need to be, you know, I could, I just managed how to get proper change from buying my food in this market. And I think, well, actually my van trip is a good example. I traveled with a friend from college. I was sort of too scared to do it alone. Um, and so we made a good team after that trip, 
I realized that even though it was cool to have a friend, I didn't need the friend. I could have been solo the whole time. It's the same way you go on a, a college educational trip with a big group of people. And the more you're with them, the more you challenge yourself within that group, the more you realize that there more things are possible. And so often I'll, I mean, I'll talk to retired people and they're, they're like, oh, there's an elder hosta trip to here and here. Should I do an independent trip? Well, do the elder hosta trip, learn, learn the ropes a little bit, and then you'll have more tools. Like I say, you know, you, you get, um, uh, smarter with each day on the on the road. I was you know, on my own podcast. I was interviewing a woman. She said, "Yeah, it's my mediocre now brain." And I love that phrase that your brain now is not as good as it will be after one week on the road. You'll yeah. just, you'll just have context for everything that you've studied. And so, um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah, and the scratching the itch is interesting too because I always I had these trips, and my thought was always, "Okay, I'll do this trip." scratch that itch and then I can grow up. I can become an adult, mm, you know, I can mm. settle down and, and do the do the normal life. But there's a part of, there's an aspect of traveling that leaves you wanting more. You know, there's so much more of the world. Even I spent, you know, 10 days in Burma or nine, 10 days in the Philippines, but which is a significant amount of time, but not enough either. There's so many parts of the country I didn't see or even parts of this that city that I wasn't able to truly experience in, or three weeks in Vietnam that just never feels like enough. And so, yeah, you scratch that itch, but oh, there's so much more out there. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's people who count their countries. There's yeah. competitive travelers. Yeah. And there's just the idea of what does it count to be in a country? Like you can be in Russia for a week, but that that's bigger than, that's like one seventh of the world is Russia. Versus you go to San Marino, you know, that's smaller than the Manhattan Island in New York, you know? So I think when you're, before you travel much, you think, well, I'm going to tick off these things from my list. Well, then each place on your list is way more interesting than you realize when you put it on your list. And then suddenly you think, wow, I'd love to learn th this language that we drove past this valley in Northern Italy that we didn't even go there, but it was so pretty. I want to go back there someday. And so that's, this is actually good news. You may start with a, a list of 50 countries you want to go to, but after you've been to 10, you realize that you sort of want to go back to a couple of those countries again and again and again. And that counts. I think the sad thing about counting countries is that you're racing off to get to Bhutan when in fact you've already fallen in love with Switzerland or you know Zambia or wherever. And then suddenly, because you're into your list more than your heart, you're chasing after some idea that made sense 20 years ago, but has ceased to make sense now. Yeah, and that resonates with me too. I get asked all the time, how many countries have you been to? Or what's your favorite country? These are very difficult questions to answer because then you get into, well, what counts as having gone to the country? I was in on the border mm. between Brazil and Colombia and we crossed the border, had lunch in Colombia, had a pizza. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't even like typical Colombian food and then came across back into, into Brazil. And so I feel very uncomfortable saying I've been to Colombia, but that, that extends also to some of my longer trips where I don't know that at what point can you fully say that you've been to a country and then what's your favorite country? It's just so hard to answer that because they're so different and the experiences are different. Can, you know, compare in Burma, we did a hike, uh, overnight hike and slept in a monastery and woke up at you know 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. with the chanting of the monks uh, that was an incredible experience that you can't compare to swimming with whale sharks in the Philippines for instance there's such different experiences so uh, yeah How do, what's, what's your go-to answer when, I mean, I'm sure you get this question all the time what's your favorite country right yeah <laughs> Um, and then also how many countries have you been to right. all that stuff? Like it, there's a point at which I sort of stopped counting. Like I couldn't tell you how many countries I've been to just because it's so unimportant to me now. And actually there's places that I haven't, you know, my wife has Norwegian ancestry. I've never been to Norway. I'm excited about going there, but not in a country counting sense. Now I have a pretext that will make Norway super interesting. Right. I think also even travel writing, which is my milieu, it's, there's a lot of top 10 list, uh, travel features. People love a bullet pointed uh, article. And so that's why they say, well, what's your favorite? They sort of want to know what's the best, hottest place to go to. Um, in a way, it doesn't matter because basically, I think I say in Vagabond, you go to a place and then you figure out what you're doing there. You know, you figure out why you're there once that happens. Mm -hmm. And so it's normal. I think we were talking earlier and, and you said, what question do you get that's hard to answer? And I said, oh, favorite country. And the next day as a joke, you said, what's your favorite country? But I get that question so much, I was trying to sort of be polite with you, <laughs> even though you're, you're, you're yanking my chain. Um, and, and so I think it's good, like 
it's it's an understandable question because it gives them ideas. Oh, your favorite country is is Botswana. Really, Botswana? I'm going to look up Botswana now. It's it, it's sort of a way we exchange information as travelers. Yeah. Um, it's sort of worthless because how can you even decide what that is? And like you said, you eat lunch in Colombia. I had an equivalent uh, the opposite way from Uruguay to Brazil. I had lunch in Brazil and. I felt like I was sort of felt like I was there, but it's not the same as waking up in a monastery, which I've also done in Myanmar. Yeah. And so I think you don't want to cheapen your Columbia pizza experience because that was cool in its own way. It's just, yeah. but it was unique to itself and it can't really be compared against waking up in a monastery in Myanmar. And so I think keeping score against yourself is not productive, that ultimately you just have to appreciate that an afternoon for what it is or a month for what it is. My go-to answer was always Burma. And it was because and this gets to another tension you talk about, which is the tourist traveler kind of distinction people often make that is a little frustrating at times because honestly, we're all tourists right? mm-hmm. we're on a, in a different country. But then how do you think of yourself? I'm not a tourist, I'm a traveler. But in Burma, there weren't that many tourists when I was there. It hadn't been opened up for, for too many years. And it was easy to get off the beaten path. It was easier not to see so many people like me, which is which is weird because I am, right? I, I am the people that I tend to hate, right? When, I, mm-hmm. when I'm abroad, you know? And, and so how do, you, how do you handle that tension when you travel, you're a tourist, but you want to really be a part of the, the culture. You want to have that authentic experience with the culture. There's like this idea of the staged authenticity too, which is, yeah. it's a hard tension. Well, it is, and, it, and it's tied into expectations, really, um, because we expect authenticity to look like this. And then we show up and this dude who lives in the tribal version of Ethiopia is sort of dressed like we are. And well, how is he less Ethiopian? You know, he just, yeah. he, those, those clothes are probably comfortable. So um, yeah, it's, I, I think Walker Percy has written about this. There's an essay called The Loss of the Creature. Have you read much no, Walker Percy? No, no, no. He sort of basically has a line is like, how can we see more when fewer people are absent? You know, is looking like sucking. The, the, the more people there are, the less there is to see. That is basically an entire, it's a very philosophical essay talking about what um, the expectations we bring to a place and how we sort of feel um, like we, we, we own this place a little bit more if we don't have to share it with other people. So it's, it's a really weird thing. And the tourist traveler dichotomy, of course, we're all outsiders, but it goes actually back to in, in the European milieu, um, the idea that aristocrats would travel, they would take the grand tour as part of their birthright, being wealthy people from Western European countries. Well, when Thomas Cook, uh, the the entrepreneuring tour guide guy who invented tours in England in the 1830s and 1840s, suddenly there were middle-class people traveling too. Loud people, there were women, God forbid, women would come on these trips. And so suddenly this, it's sort of a classist dichotomy that, oh, travelers, they're more sophisticated, they're more educated. Tourists are these loud, noisy people who breathe out of their mouths and ride on buses, right? <laughs> and I think people are people look for this dichotomy because they want to be better travelers. They don't want to be rude. They don't want to be culturally insensitive. But it's so simplistic to say, I'm a tr- traveler and you're a tourist, when in fact, we're all outsiders in a place. Right. Um, and I think there's, instead of worrying about that dichotomy, just traveling slowly, yeah. being super polite, listening. And that's one thing Americans have a bad um, reputation for is that sometimes talking is not as good as listening and just sort of getting to know a place. And we've talked about this, you and I, in other contexts that oftentimes well-meaning Christian people, volunteers will go to a place and it's like, how can I help, you know? And then they'll post their selfies of helping in some foreign country. And it's like, well, how can I help? You know, the emphasis is on I, they want to feel good about a place when in fact, listening to the person, you know, getting to know them saying, well, what, before it's like, how can I help you say, well, where do people go to school here? What do you eat? What are your what are your houses built like? You basically when you're when you, when you're going to give charity to a person you don't know yet, you're sort of putting the cart before the horse right. in a certain sense. And so I think instead of worrying about those dichotomies, um, just admit that we're all outsiders and we're we're all bumblers to a certain extent. And the more we get to know our host cultures, the more we can understand how to be good guests yeah. and to give back. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned earlier too about the language component. Americans also have a bad reputation. We, there's the the um, the stereotype that they refuse to learn the language. Uh, you know, they you just speak really loudly, right? And somehow that's going to get that's going to get across. And you mentioned something the other day about even in front. There's this there's this idea that the French people hate it when you speak French. And I've I've spent so much of my time trying to uh, dispel that that which what I think is false. It's not true. Uh, you know, they're there might be that one French person who gets mad at you, but he's going to get mad at you no matter what you do. But overwhelmingly, even even the French, 
they love it when you try to learn their language, when mm. you, when you make an effort, uh, when you, when you, yeah, when you try, you, you've spent some time in France. Is, would you agree with that? Is that an accurate statement? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the, it's the stereotype of the, of the rude Frenchman. Yeah. And I think that there's, there's a little bit of a class element there too, is that the upper crust, the super high class French people, they just look down their noses at everybody. It's their birthright to be a snob. But usually you interact with more working class, middle class people in France. And even though when French people get irritated at you, it's because you're walking on the bus and it's like, is this the one that goes to the Louvre? Hey, you, I'm talking to you. Instead of just saying, bonjour, monsieur. Not only is the language different, it's a more formal culture where we walk into the store, we walk into a store in the United States and it's like, uh, do you have Doritos here? In France, it's like, uh, bonjour, madame. And you talk about the weather and then you ask where the Doritos are. Probably not the Doritos <laughs> in France. Um, and so it's, it's uh, I think, making an effort. I'll, I'll tell you a joke. You've probably heard it before. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. A person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. A person who speaks only one language? I know the answer. An American, American right? American, yeah. And so it's, it's, a, it's a worldwide joke that Americans are really bad at saying second languages. There's a geographical region why, you know, it's, it's a giant country. You have two borders. One of them borders with an English-speaking country. Yeah. Um, but trying counts for a lot. I think even in France, which is... Um, stereotypically snobby, anywhere you learn a few numbers, hello, pleasantries, um, once people realize you're trying, you know, then you get so much open-hearted goodwill compared to being the rude person who's yeah. just talking, who's yelling in English and hoping somebody understands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What's next? What, what are some adventures that are, that are coming up? You got a list? Uh, ooh. <laughs> Well, I have a bunch of ideas in mind and it's funny, we're, um, we're in Oregon now. I'm, I've been in Kansas since the pandemic. I haven't traveled very much um, because of the pandemic. And, right. um, and then I, I met my wife during the pandemic. So that's sort of a fun way to, to spend the pandemic. But um, with any luck, inshallah, as they say in Arabic speaking inshallah. countries, yeah. God willing, um, we will go to Kenya uh, this spring, we'd like to climb Mount Kenya. My wife is a big hiker. And then I teach a class in Paris every summer. And then my wife's family has Norwegian ancestry. She has Norwegian cousins and I've never been there. So fingers crossed, it will be a Kenya, Paris, Norway summer. <laughs> and then with any luck, travel will become a more normalized thing. I don't wanna to be too glib and cavalier about things. I wanna be careful and make wise travel decisions. But I think just because the travel industry is suffering doesn't mean we can't travel. We just have to be careful about where we're going. and quarantine and get our immunizations and things like that. And so hopefully, I mean, it's just been so exciting to, I felt so normal getting on a plane and flying to Oregon. Um, it just felt good in a very subtle way that I suspect if my Kenya and Norway and Paris travelers work out this summer, then I'll sort of feel more myself again. And it'll be fun to be out on the road. That brings up a good point too. Should we travel during the pandemic? There's been some, you know, some conversation, you know, stay home, uh, you know, hunker down, quarantine, don't travel now, wait till the pandemic's over. What's your, what's your response to that? Well, I, from a scientific standpoint, I think COVID will always be with us, just like flu is, influenza is, is always with us. And I usually, when people present this, uh, I give them historical examples. Like when the pandemic first started, they said, oh, well, Shakespeare wrote some of his great plays during a plague pandemic, but people didn't talk about travel, I think because it, people don't know this, but, um, some of the greatest eras of travel have come right after or sometimes during pandemics, um, during the influenza pandemic. That was 1818 to, eight, I'm sorry, 1918 to 1920. Well, the roaring 20s happened right after that. Hemingway in Paris and all of these great um, stories about this newly globalized travel, that the airplane revolution, meaning like the small plane, Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh type stuff was going on during that time. And that was right after a very devastating uh, pandemic. And so I think, when you're in the middle of it, you think about worst case scenarios, anxiety uh, is good clickbait in, yeah. in our media era now, that it's good to double down on each other's anxieties. And again, I think it's good to be careful to follow the, um, the advice of people who know, but just as, like if you study the history of people like Martin Osa Johnson who traveled right after the pandemic, they spent time in quarantines and they were very matter of fact about it. Like in real time, it was probably frustrating, but years later, they didn't think about the quarantine. That was just the most boring part of going to the South Pacific. Similarly, um, for example, Alexander Kinglake, the uh, British travel writer traveled from Serbia to Egypt in the 1830s during a plague pandemic. And he talked about how boring the Serbian uh, quarantines were and how friendly the Egyptians were, even though they, you know, they were very hospitable, um, even though, it was literally dangerous to talk to a stranger. 
and he did fine. And so I guess, again, I don't want to encourage anybody to travel recklessly, right. but I'm very optimistic that I think as human culture, we've forgotten that plagues uh, have and, and pandemics have always been a part of history. We've just been lucky that we had almost a century without a major one. And so, yeah, I look forward to, I think even young people who are on a college campus now can still be excited that they have a good travel career ahead of them yeah. because it's been done before. That reminds me that we had a student study abroad in Spain and we were in the conversation, this is a year ago, we asked him, can you wait? You know, if, if you can wait, maybe you'll have a better experience. Spain opens up. You're going to have this experience that you've been thinking about and, and expecting. And, and his, resp his response was, no, 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 I want to go now. I want to experience the pandemic in a foreign country. And hmm. it's just such a cool, a cool way to, to think about, again, expectations, what you think you might get out of, out of an experience. And it's going to be different, you know. And, and he talks about how because the, the city of Sevilla was kind of not shut down, but couldn't really travel, couldn't go anywhere. People, you couldn't go to restaurants, for instance. So people were on the street. People were by the river. And so he just got, he had an opportunity to meet people that way. So yeah, no, I, I, I agree. We can, let's travel, let's go. Well, I think it's more memorable too. You know, you, you talk to men who've been in war, you know, and they didn't like war, but it was a very memorable time. Time slowed down in a certain sense when you're yeah. not sure what's gonna happen. I think when you know everything that's gonna happen on your journey, then the, the best case scenario is that you can meet your expectations. Whereas if you have fewer expectations, and you're, or you're not sure what's going to happen, then you have this whole world of possibility ahead of you. And again, not to encourage reckless travel, but if you if you travel during a pandemic time, it's just historically unique. You not, might not be able to, to tick off every sightseeing place off your list, but suddenly you'll be in a quarantine with some people and and um, out in the street in Spain. Great great example. You know, the Spanish are so social and family oriented, and um, that was probably a pretty interesting interesting place to be during the pandemic compared to like Beaverton, Oregon, where everybody's in their big house with their tiny yards and nobody yeah. really knows their neighbors. Sorry, Beaverton, that's a <laughs> random example. Doritos and Beaverton. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, no, but that gets back to another point you make, which is slow down, let the trip happen to you. One of my most memorable trips was, it was 12 days um, on a boat going on the Amazon River. It would have been a lot faster to take a plane or, or another type of transportation, but to be 12 days on a boat where you couldn't do anything. I mean, you're, you're gazing out into the river, but really you spent that time talking to people, getting to know people. And a lot of the people we met were not doing this as a vacation. They were actually using this as a mode of transportation. They couldn't afford mm -hmm. um, airplanes or other modes of transportation. So it was just a, it was a really special time. You really get to know people and, and talk to them and what their story is, what their background is, where they're headed to. And I, I love that. So I, I love, I love your advice, you know, slow down, if you have 10 days, maybe don't go to 10 cities, maybe hmm. pick two cities or even just one city. And that kind of ties into the whole quarantine aspect as well, I think. Well, I think we, we see so much of life from a consumer point of view, you know. Um, and so when we see through the lens of the travel industry, what travel is like, well, then it's a bunch of consumer choices, which is fine. But sure, you can go down that river in an afternoon instead of a day. You can fly from point A to point B. But when you're on that ferry, not only, you're suddenly meeting a different class of people. You're talking to the people in that country who can't afford to fly. And they're sort of grateful. This, this American who has money to fly is hanging out with us. Let's make a place for him. Let's invite him to dinner. This, this can be fun. And I think that that is so rewarding. I think sometimes people get awkward in the face of hospitality. I think I mentioned that it's like a, it's a pillar of Islam. You know, there's nomadic cultures in particular, regardless of religious affiliation are very hospitable. It's a reciprocity is an important thing if you're a nomad, if people don't help you, if you don't help people, then how can you expect people to help you? Americans have a real guilt relationship when someone who's demonstrably poorer than them is op is offering them hospitality. And sometimes the most gracious thing to do is to just be the most polite guest and to eat up all that soup and not to make guilt-ridden promises of to pay for this or that, but just to honor their hospitality. It's something that Americans, we're okay with it, but we forget sometimes that it's actually an honor for this Bedouin person in Egypt or for this Nepalese person in Nepal to sit down and offer us hospitality. Basically, they are doing a favor to God. And if you look in, in the Old Testament, almost any religious tradition, the expectation that God places on hospitality, like least of these, my brothers, right? Yep. Um, that it, I think we've Americanized the idea of hospitality and we feel guilty instead of feeling grateful. Yeah, yeah. 
travel really helps underscore that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. And these are the experiences that you can have if you slow down and 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 take it slow. Yeah, but there's there are also you know this this difference between kind of tourist attractions and I'm thinking of Halong Bay, for instance, in Vietnam, which is super touristy, but at the same time amazing and and so worth it. Or in the Inca Trail, for instance, same thing. It's very trodden, so many tourists, but also you know you have to go there. You have to experience that. Um, do you make a choice? You know, do you do you kind of do one super touristy thing and then and then we'll we'll take it slow? Well, I think Paris is a city I know quite well, and so I use it as an example a lot. You mentioned the Eiffel Tower early, earlier. Um, I've hosted enough people to know that everyone wants to go to the Eiffel Tower. It'd be silly to go and to Paris and not go to the Eiffel Tower. I've realized that under the Eiffel Tower, you have you have people from like eighty countries yeah. having a picnic. Some of them are retirees from a culture that when they were young, their country was poor. Now they're rich enough, people from China or India, to have a picnic, something, to do something their grandparents didn't dream of. And so to be snobby about how, oh, I could be at a more, I could be at an art gallery instead of the Eiffel Tower, that basically realize that you're surrounded by people who are having the most exciting day of their life. And to realize that you're, this person is from Brasilia, right? And this person is from Jakarta, and but you're all there together. I think that's one great thing about these tourist attraction type things. Great Wall of China, Machu Picchu, the Grand Canyon, wherever. It's easy to say, oh, this is everybody's piling off the tourist bus. But then to realize how grateful to, to overlook other people's gratitude is to overlook the energy of those places. Now, that said, you wouldn't want to spend an entire month going from tourist attraction to tourist attraction. And the fun thing about a place like Paris is that walk in five blocks in any direction from the Champs-Élysées or from the Eiffel Tower and you're gonna be a place that's more authentically Parisian. Mm -hmm. And in some parts of Paris, you're gonna be eating at a Senegalese restaurant, best Senegalese food you've ever had, maybe the first time you've had it. And suddenly you're a little bit in Africa, but but definitely still in France. And you're having a, an iconically Parisian experience that isn't you know, icon, isn't uh, stereotypically French, right? That any world city now is going to be a mix of cultures. Um, even like my wife knows I love Korean food. She took me to find Korean food in Kansas and we were next to a military base <laughs> and it wasn't even that big of a place, but we had Korean food and it was fun that you can, you can find a little bit of the world at home. And that's one fun thing about coming home is that you suddenly you get excited about finding a Korean restaurant near yeah. where you live in Kansas. Yeah, even though you can say this isn't really Korea, I was there, you know. Well, I no, said, that's what I said to my, this, the portions are huge and it's a little bit sweeter than <laughs> Korean food. And she's like, come on, they're feeding 19 year old soldiers. Of course it's that way. That gets me to another thing you talk about, which is the difference between traveling in your 20s and traveling in your 50s. I, I know that for me, the trip I took across Europe, sleeping in on the, on the you know, on pavement and under bridges, it, it's uncomfortable. I, mean, I had a knot in my back for a while as a result. Now I need, a, it, it needs to be a little bit more comfortable. I need to have a slightly more comfortable bed, but I miss those days. I, I miss the, the days of my 20s when I was penniless and trying to figure out how I was going to pay for something, you know, eating bread, cheese, sometimes mayonnaise, you know. Hmm. How, how has travel changed for you from your 20s to now? To you? Well, that's exciting. I mean, I miss my dirtbag 20s days. I miss, I've slept in a horseshoe pit in Glenwood Springs, Colorado once, you know, in a public park. Um, Heraclitus said you you never step in the same river twice because it's a different river and you're a different man, you know? And that's exciting. Like, I really miss the travel that I did in my 20s because I was fearless. I went down the Mekong, I slept in parks and I never had any money. So every day was problem solving, how to get this, this much out of the $5 I had in my pocket. And that was so fun because it was so new, but then I didn't have a lot of money. I just had my own, you know, wits, right? Well, now I'm older and more financially stable and I don't wanna sleep <laughs> under a bridge. <laughs> my back is way worse than it used to be. Um, but that's a blessing too, that, that again, it's actually, it's sort of fun to be a person who's 20, 30 years older than they were when they were first traveling, but can afford to rent a four by four in Mozambique or doesn't mind, or, or just a little bit savvier, you know? Um, so. Yeah, I don't think I would want to, even though I miss all the time the way I traveled in my 20s, I wouldn't want to travel that way now because I'd just be the sad 51-year-old <laughs> who's sleeping under a bridge to feel like he's in his 20s again. Um, and so it's a blessing. In some ways, I'm I'm uh, a lot smarter and savvier. I'm a better listener in that sort of um, against my American instincts kind of way. And I'm, uh, it, it's, it's a fun, growing older 
in America is seen as a bad thing, but you go to a place like India where there's, or China where there's specific ways to honor people who are growing older mm -hmm. to realize that um, you have the blessing of being a few decades older, plus the fond memories of being a dirtbag traveler <laughs> in your 20s. It's a good combination. And this is why, part of why I wrote Vagabonding is that you don't have to scratch your travel edge and do that trip as a junior in college and then be done with it for the rest of your life, that you can have a relationship with travel your whole life that is actually a great relationship with home, that you come back a little bit more equipped to give back to your own community and to translate the rest of the world for your own community. Yeah, that's a, bringing it full circle because part of this is is the hope that young people are encouraged to travel. I, I talk to so many students who don't know how they're going to afford it. You know, how can I afford this? And I always talk about it. I don't, I was penniless. You know, I talk about all these adventures and the question is always, how did you, how did you afford this? How did you pay for this? I had no money. And yet, and somehow I made it happen. And I, and I do think back fondly to those times, but I don't know that I want to go back there now. You know, I, I, I'm a little bit more comfortable now, but I do want to encourage, uh, I, I, and I always do this, you know, encourage um, college students to take that gap year, to take those two years. You taught in, in South Korea for two years. I was in Taiwan for two years. And even, and it's not like you're putting your life on hold. Like, you're just, let's put my life, you know, two years, I'll go do this and then come back to my real life or whatever that might mean. There's so many adventures to be had while you're working, which is another great um, way to, to enter into the culture. You know, so many people, when you travel, you might meet some people, but if you're working, you're meeting people who work at, you know, your coworkers and so forth, but even the people as you enter, your students, teaching English, I think is a great way to, to see the world as well. Well, being an expatriate, in whatever capacity at some point in your life is huge because you you get a different relationship to it. I've said before that in Korea, I was often depressed and sad and stressed out, but that was an important thing to go through. I wasn't there in a consumer capacity. I was there to, to, to teach English and get to know people. And Koreans were actually very friendly, but it's a very hardworking culture. And um, I learned so much. Um, you were talking earlier about how you can travel more when you're young. Young people don't have a lot of money, but they have way more time than anybody else. Time wealth is the core philosophy of vagabonding that basically, you know, I've talked on to people who've, who've done business with billionaires and they, they said it's hard to get three billionaires in the same room at the same time because they don't have time for anything. And it's like, come, it's too bad, you know, because when I was 20, I didn't have much money. I had all the time in the world. Um, and so just the idea of time wealth is important to consider. It's like we, we might, we're a very rich country in the United States, but oftentimes we're very poor in time. We have a bunch of junk, but no time to use it. Yeah. And so, one thing I tell young people is realize your time well. You have no better time in life. I'm still traveling a lot in my 50s, but um, when you're young, just realize that you might not have a lot of money in your bank, but find ways to what use what little money you have to make your life more exciting and to seed your future with possibility and, and to enjoy yourself. It's not a bad thing to have fun. Yeah, and it's, it, it's surprising when you start traveling how it doesn't really take that much. It's really not that hard to make it happen. You talk about the the Charlie Sheen character and is it Wall Street? Is mm -hmm. that the movie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where he's like, I need to make all this money so that I can, what was his dream? He wanted to like drive, ride a motorcycle across Asia or something. Uh, across China. He across said, China. by the time I turn 30, I want to get out of this racket and have enough money to ride my motorcycle across China. And it's like, what? Actually, that really, that line really resonates uh, with people. Um, uh, Tim Ferriss wrote a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, sort of took that example of that mindset where we just think we want, we need to buy our freedom when in fact we can sort of give it to ourselves. And, and really, it, it's probably not the same China as a wealthier country than it was when I wrote that book, but you don't need that much money to buy a motorcycle when you get to China or when you get to Southeast Asia or wherever. Um, and so, so really, I think even though my book is about travel, it's also about time wealth and that idea of you're given so much time uh, to live. And so how are you going to spend that time? Um, and one fun thing about being on, on a college campus is about the, around the time people are finishing school, they're thinking about, well, how am I going to allocate my time moving forward? So it's a very philosophical time of life to be thinking about this stuff. Although you don't have to be a, a college student to wrap your head around time wealth. It's, it's a matter of values. You know, it's a, it's a spiritual way of being in the world rather than a strictly consumerist material way of being in the world. Yeah. I love your response to the story though, because don't you realize, Charlie Sheen, that you could just work for eight months and then you could fund your trip and-, and As a toilet so. cleaner, I think I said. <laughs> yeah. And again, maybe not, maybe you, you'd have to work a little bit longer cleaning toilets, but but yeah, it's not, that was, there's other lines from that movie where basically I think Gordon Gecko says, money is a way of keeping score. And 
yeah, in America, we have more money than we know how to use. We, we feel superior to somebody else because we have a bigger car, more money in our bank account. But what, if, what did you do last year? Yeah. I went to Myanmar and rode a bike around. Bike cost me $30, dinner cost me 50 <laughs> cents. Um, and not to, not to be a show offy that way, right. I think that travel is great because it can improve your life in relation to yourself. You know, travel as a consumer act is often seen as conspicuous consumption. It's like, oh, well, I, I went to Kamchatka Peninsula. Where have you been? <laughs> well, that's not the best way of thinking about it. Just quietly use travel to, in, to make your life deeper and to yeah. build stronger relationships, not only with other cultures, but with your, with your home, figure out ways to give back. Yeah. For me, I think I always wanted experiences. We have a similar experience, I think, in the sense that I, I witnessed my friend whose parents had been saving up their entire life for this massive trip they were going to take when they retired. And right about the time they, they were going to retire, uh, his mother got sick and ended up dying six months later. And the father, same, can, same kind of cancer, ended up dying. And, I, and to witness my friend go through this, not, I mean, trauma for sure, but, but to kind of realize that, wow, they worked their entire life for this thing that, that never happened. And to see him then make some decisions of I'm going to I'm going to make it count now. Uh, you talk also about is it your your parents or your, your grandfather? My right? grandfather, yeah. yeah. As you were saying that, it's like gosh, I have a, a similar story. Um, yeah, my grandfather quit school in, in eighth grade to start farming um, and worked hard, raised six kids, um, married his true love, um, saved up. If anybody had earned its retirement, it was him. But then my grandmother got Alzheimer's disease towards in her fifties, I think. And he couldn't enjoy his retirement, not that he dreamed of travel, but he couldn't, basically he'd worked so hard since he was 15 years old. And then suddenly he couldn't just put his feet up and enjoy things. My grandmother's health declined. And so that was very sad for me when I was a teenager, I saw that happening. And so I think that's what sort of broke me out of that, that sort of American lockstep where it's like, no, no young man, work hard and life will reward you at the end with free time. Well, it doesn't, I saw it, I literally saw it happen. And I think there's this sort of old Puritan work ethic model, whereas we're, we're conditioned to feel guilty for doing something for ourselves when we're young. And in, in many ways, I've been very employable. I've been very in very strong touch with my family and my community, not in spite of, but because of travel. Yeah. You know, it was, you mentioned Vietnam before. I, I traveled in Vietnam and I saw, saw so many, how so many families make financial decisions as a group that they will go in together, multiple generations will buy property mm -hmm. together. And I've done that in Kansas, that I live very close to my nuclear family in Kansas. And uh, maybe I would have done it either anyway, but I saw how important people, we, we give lip service to family in the United States, but people make decisions as a family in other parts of the world. And that literally influenced my own decision to be based in Kansas near my own family. Yeah, yeah but that, that desire for experiences, that's, I think, I, I envision myself getting older and then the kind of travel that's possible when you're older, if I'm already, I'm in my mid forties and I, there's certain comforts that I need. I can't imagine when I'm 60, the kind of comforts I'm going to need when I travel, you know? And so I had this desire to kind of just do it all, figure out a, a way to do it all <clears throat> and then, and then retire, you know, and then, and see what kind of free time I have. But yeah, I was, I was, I was, I've heard you tell that story before and, and I have a very similar experience, not because it happened to my family, but because I witnessed a good friend of mine, um, go through it with his, with his parents, but that, and so that's, I encourage students in that, in that regard too, you know, take your twenties, travel, uh, make it happen and you won't regret it. And that gap year, people are afraid of this gap year, but you've said it numerous times that, uh, you know, that gap year is going to make you in some ways, maybe more employable, more interesting of a person, um, um, you know, of course, depending on the, on the kind of experience, but. And actually yeah. some listeners might not know what a gap year is. It's such a European way of looking at things. We're in the, U in the UK, often Brits will take a gap year when they're 18, 17 years old, before university, they'll take a year off and travel or get a job someplace. Mm -hmm. We don't have that ritual in the United States. We have study abroad or internships or various things, but we don't have that permission. I think in, there's a German ritual, Wunderjahr, I think basically their, their internship is a traveling internship mm -hmm. type thing. We don't have a cultural pretext to mix travel into our lives yet, especially in your twenties. You're, you know, you're as you get older, you have less options. On the other side of my family, the lawyer side of my family, my grandmother with her second husband sailed around the world, and when she was in her sixties, and if you read her journal, it's like, yeah, I played pinochle today, played bridge today, and it's like, grandma, you're doing the same things you did at home, <laughs> and so I think you're more daring in your twenties. You're more excited by everything. You're more likely to be less driven by habit when you're away from home, and so even though we don't have a formalized gap year in the United States. 
just remember when you're young, you don't need anyone's permission, but your own, yeah. you know? And, and sometimes you don't even need your parents' permission. And, and uh, people have been worried about this before. And it's like, well, they're nervous because they didn't do it. And maybe they're nervous, but they're jealous. And just say, mom, I'll buy you some, some souvenirs and come meet me in Beijing. And I literally did that. My parents, the first time my mom left the United States was to meet me in Korea. The second time was in China. And we took the Trans-Mongolian into Mongolia. And to this day, my parents are now in their 70s, late, 80s, late 70s, early 80s. We talk about Prague and Mongolia and DC and New York all the time. It was, it was such a strengthening experience for us because I got to sort of be the adult in that situation and, and host them. So I think yeah, uh, find ways to get permission and then let it happen. The worst that can happen is that you've gone to an interesting part of the world and yeah. now you're back home and you enjoy a functioning toilet, you know, that <laughs> that there are, if nothing Running else- water, in, you know. Yeah, yeah, or, or a sports center on TV every <laughs> night. You know, whatever you missed, you're gonna taste it that much more sweetly now. And then suddenly you'll find yourself homesick for that part of the world that at the time drove you crazy, but now you realize that it actually made you a better person, so. Yeah. Well, great, it's been great talking to you. Great chatting with you. Any any last words of advice or any last comment? Well, I think, you know, for anybody who's thinking of travel, that the first step is deciding to do it. You know, even if you don't, if you, if, if you haven't saved enough money so that the first literal step of the trip isn't until two years from now, that sort of psychically the trip begins when you, and life is more exciting when you realize that I'm going to, skip buying this fancy coffee today and that's gonna give me six more dollars for my travel fund. It's an exciting, I think even neurologists have said that the pleasure of travel begins when you start dreaming about it. And so start dreaming about it now, even if it's not logistically possible for a little while longer. Yeah, great, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me here. George Fox Talks is a production of George Fox Digital. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us out by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube by searching for George Fox Talks. And lastly, check out georgefox.edu slash talks, where we feature lectures, interviews, publications, and a lot more accessible academic content.